Hello and welcome to the Caroline Cymru Revision Sessions. My name is Mr Andrew Morell and I'm a uh, politics and history teacher at Ysgol Uchran Llanidlois High School and these sessions are focusing on politics AS and are for the spring 2024 sessions. The last session of uh, recording on which um, you'll have already seen online was a comparison between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. This second session will be a comparison between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And then the next session, which will be the following video, will be a comparison between the Prime Minister and the First Minister. So today, then, we're going to look at a comparison between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Now, this fits into 1.2, Unit 1, Section 2, the Government of the UK, and in particular 1.2.2, which is how Parliament works in the UK. And so you can see the very first bullet point here circled says the structure, role and powers of Parliament. And that's what we're going to look at, because, of course, Parliament is made up of two elements, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So Parliament, when we talk about the structure, role and powers of it, we're looking at the structure, role and powers of the House of Commons and the structure, roles and powers of the House of Lords. So what I want you to do whilst, we're, uh, whilst you're going through this video, whilst you're watching this video, is to use the information that I'm giving you, not just to sit back and listen to what I'm saying, but to use it in a way then that means it's going to settle in to that brain of yours a lot better and you'll be easy, more easily able to recall it. So the task I want you to do is this, essentially. It is a Venn diagram. It's the easiest thing in the world for you to do. Get a piece of A4 paper or A3 if you think you're going to fill bigger space, right? And draw two big circles, making sure there is an overlap, just like you can see here. Now, you'd have seen that I used this in my first session as well. Apologies. And you've seen I used this in my first session as well. Now, the reason we're doing this is because revision is about reusing knowledge you have to ensure you're familiar with it in your mind. And you do that, to be fair, you do that by listening to what I'm saying. But it's also about clearly siloing uh, information, stuff you've learned with the specification. Uh, and also it is to make connections and to use that knowledge in new ways. And the reason why these things are important is because these are things that the exams you'll sit will require. It will require you to reuse and recall knowledge in your brain. It require you to have siloed it, to categorise it to some extent in your mind, because you'll need to make sure you're talking and staying specific to what the question is asked. And also the way the questions are written are designed explicitly to make you make connections between what you found out in order to more accurately and more truly answer the question that's set. So this Venn diagram will help you do that. So label the first bigger circles on either side differences. You could also talk about them as uniqueness, right? What makes them unique? And the middle, the overlap, is similarities. Similarities. So what you do as we go through this session, in the biggest bubbles on the left and right, you will fill that with things that are distinct and different about the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and the middle, that overlap, things that are the same. So pause the video for a second if you need, create your big Venn diagram, label it up, and then you're ready to go. So, the Houses of Parliament. The Houses of Parliament are, as you can see that picture there, very, very iconic. We all know what we're talking about when we see that picture of Big Ben in the foreground there, you name it. Now, what's what is important about this is the Houses of Parliament are made up of two chambers, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Now, the House of Commons is known as the primary chamber and the lower house. Primary chamber, because that's primarily where legislation comes from, and the lower house because it's kind of um, uh, the less senior, I suppose, is probably one way of putting it. And the House of Lords is often called the second chamber and it is the upper house. And these houses have their own roles and structure. There's some similarities, obviously, otherwise we won't get you to do that Venn diagram. But there are also some distinct features about these two things, which means it is really important. We look at them separately and we know these differences. 
So therefore, when the specification asks you about that role, structure and power of Parliament, you've got to know those differences between the House of Commons role, structure and power and the House of Lords role, structure and power. So the first thing we need to do, right, even and pause it if you need to, is to use this map here that shows you, as you can see in the top left hand corner, the general election results from December 2019. So I want you to use this map now to come up with four specific pieces of information about the House of Commons. So I'll stop, pause it, see if you can think of four specific pieces. Now this map shows you a lot, right? In fact, it shows you a lot more than four specific pieces, I would say. For example, the first thing it, it does is it shows you that from every corner of the country comes an MP that represents people and sits in the House of Commons. It can show you that the vast majority of England is Conservative. The vast majority of Scotland is SNP. The vast majority of Wales is also Conservative or maybe Labour, right? So firstly, you can see that they work in parties. Second then, or third, I should say, because we've already said it, tells you from every area of the country, Northern Ireland has completely distinct parties. You can see we've got the DUP, Sinn Féin, SDLP, APNI, which we don't have anywhere else in the UK. So this general election map also tells you from the title that it is created as a result of an election. So members of the House of Commons are elected by the people, which happens every five years, and this one, 2019. So the House of Commons, most crucially, the members are elected every five years at a maximum, it could be more frequently than that, to be members of Parliament for their specific constituency. That could be Ceredigion, that could be Montgomeryshire, that could be Arvon, that could be Dwyver Merionev. And in total, there are 650 of these MPs in the House of Commons. And currently of those 650, 350 are Conservative, 198 are Labour, 43 are SNP, 15 are Liberal Democrats, and eight are Democratic Unionists, whilst there are three Plaid Cymru. And then there are other parties, and there are some independents as well. And to be honest, I'm telling you these figures, but they may well change even by the time this video is published online, because MPs sometimes lose the party whip, or there's by-elections coming, which changes this as well. And these MPs are currently paid £86,584 a year for being an MP, and they also get additional for other responsibilities. If they're chairs of select committees, if they're ministers, things like that, they will be paid more money. And the House of Commons is most recognisable by those green benches and by the increasingly kind of celebrity like status of the speaker. So this here, this here on the right is a picture of the House of Commons. You can just see where the Prime Minister or the ex-Prime Minister Boris Johnson stood behind him. There is the green bench. You can see the same behind the speaker, Sir Lindsay Hall there is the green bench. This is what is recognisable about the House of Commons and you can see it in the colour of the logo as well. And the current speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle is crucially not a member of any political party. So as soon as the speaker is elected a speaker, he or she has to give up their party membership in order to prevent them from having a political bias. And the reason is, is because the speaker controls who can speak and his job or her job is to ensure that parliamentary standards are upheld. So they've got to be unbiased now they do it. They can't favour a specific party. Otherwise, they may be tempted to call that specific party to speak more frequently, or they may be tempted to hold lower standards for that political party than the other political parties. And within these, within the House of Commons, and these MPs you can see here in this picture, there are two distinct types. You've got, quite literally, sitting on the front bench, you've got front bench MPs. Now, these are the government themselves, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Minister for Education, but they're also the shadow government as well, the opposition, which is currently the Labour Party. So the leader of the opposition at the moment is Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, for example. And behind them, further back on the back benches, are 
the backbench MPs. So it's quite literal. The front bench MPs sit on the front bench in the House of Commons and backbench MPs sit on the back. So if you're a backbench MP, you can't go and sit on those front benches. I think you'll get a few, uh, few nasty glares from those MPs who are ministers and shadow members, uh, members of the shadow government as well. So what about the House of Lords then? So the House of Lords are appointed by the monarch. So they're not elected. I can't show you a map of where these uh, lords come from, where they represent, because they are appointed, not elected to represent specific constituencies. Now, we may well have uh, lords from the vast majority of constituencies, but there does tend to be a suggestion that majority of the lords live in London and not in those further extremities like Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, northeast of England. Now, in order to be appointed as a monarch, as, as a lord by the monarch, this could come either through the House of Lords Appointments Commission, in which they try to seek out experts in their field to appoint them. Or it could be as resignation honours of the prime minister. The prime minister, when he or she resigns, can make people, can elevate people to the House of Lords. It could be as a result of ad hoc political announcements, which we'll look at one specific, very recent example a bit later on in this uh, in this session. And also as an archbishop or a bishop. So within the House of Lords, there are a certain number, 26, who are archbishops or bishops. And they're not there because the uh, prime minister decided it, but because the Church of England has appointed them and the monarch then has agreed to it. Now, um, one thing that is often is often forgotten about is that actually there are some 92 members of the House of Lords who are actually elected. Now, they're not elected by everyone in the country as a whole because they're what we call hereditary peers. So they've inherited their titles. So the reason they're a lord is because their father was a lord before them. But what happens and what happened ever since 1997 is that these lords now no longer get an automatic right to sit in the House of Lords like before. Instead, they've got to be elected amongst themselves. So amongst all the hundreds of hereditary laws, 92 can be elected to sit in the House of Commons. Sorry, the House of Lords. Now, in total, there are currently 785 members of the Lords, and that is a really interesting and poignant number because it means it is the only democracy in the world that has two chambers in which the upper chamber is bigger than the primary chamber. The upper house is bigger than the lower house. The prime, uh, secondary chamber is bigger than the primary chamber. There are more lords than there are MPs. Now, in order to encourage them to go along, they have a daily allowance of £332 plus then expenses paid as well. Now, currently within the House of Lords, uh, who are, as I, which I forgot to say here, and I are distinct in the red benches that they sit on, as you can see here, which matches the red logo. Currently, there are 270 Conservatives, 175 Labour. There are zero, there are no SNP members who refuse to sit out of principle. There are 80 Liberal Democrats, which is interesting. We saw there are only 18 Liberal Democrat MPs, but 80 Liberal Democrat Lords. It's a big discrepancy. There's one Plaid Cymru Lord, and then there are some from other parties as well. Now, there are also what we call cross benches and you can literally see this in this picture in front of us so you've got on the one hand here you've got the government bench on the other hand here because the speaker is sat on the wool sack here so this is the government bench and this is the opposition bench these mp uh, sorry these lords sat in the middle are quite literally cross benches and they're non-political they're not a member of any political party and so they're often, these are often the ones that are, appoint, are appointed as experts. And as a collective, these are all known as the Lord Temporal. But as I said earlier, there are also some archbishops and bishops that are lords. And these are known as Lords Spiritual. Now, also, these only come from the Church of England. They don't come from a church in Wales. They don't come from a church in Scotland or Northern Ireland. So really, they're only representing England. Whilst the Speaker of the House then, Speaker of the Lords, sits on the wool sack down the bottom here, just like the Commons, the Speaker controls who can speak, ensures parliamentary standards are upheld, and is always there to guide print, guide proceedings, either them 
or the Deputy Lord Speaker. So the structure of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords is what we call adversarial. Now, what we mean that mean by that is that they're kind of fighting it off against each other almost. There's almost a us versus them. Now you can see that because quite literally here in the House of Commons, you can see from the green benches, they are quite literally sat facing the others. So this side here is the government. This side here is the opposition. It's the same here in the House of Lords. This side here, I'm just going to write op for short, is the opposition. And this side here is the government. So what it does, it means it provides a much more natural us versus them, us and them kind of way of doing politics. Now, the only difference is in the Lords, you've got these Lords in the middle, the cross benches that symbolically sit between parties and kind of out of politics. But nonetheless, this is adversarial. They are against each other. And that's very, very different, isn't it, to what you have seen in looking at the uh, the shape of the Senev, which is a curved shape where they're not necessarily sat facing each other, but they're all collectively working together a little bit more. Not necessarily always the case, but nonetheless. So this is another key element of the structure of the Houses of Parliament is that they are adversarial. So what are the roles of the Houses of Parliament then? What are their actual roles? What do they do? Well, the Houses of Parliament have three main roles. First is to pass legislation or laws. The second is to scrutinise the executive or the government. And the third is to provide ministers to that executive, to that government. Now, there are additionally some roles that are specific to the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So the House of Commons has the role of representing the electorate, those people who voted for them in their constituencies, maybe in Montgomeryshire or Ceredigion or Avon or whatever. And the House of Lords has an additional role of receiving and hosting the monarch. So in this previous slide here, right at the very front of the Lords, you can see this great big guild uh, throne, for want of another word. And right in the middle then, you have got King Charles I, third, apologies, and the Queen as well. You would never see that in the House of Commons. So what about passive legislation? What does it do? How does it work? Well, this is quite frankly the most important function of Parliament to make laws that govern our country. And it has supreme authority in the UK to pass and amend laws on any subject. So if it makes a law on the environment or tax or health or security, then it supersedes. It goes above any other law made in any of the other parliaments like the Senate in Wales or Holyrood in Scotland. And any law can be made by a simple majority, just 50% plus one of the MPs or Lords need to vote for it in order for it to happen. Now, Parliament, in order to kind of move through these laws, relies heavily on legislation, laws or bills being put before it by the government. So it doesn't really set its own legislative agenda. It doesn't really kind of work together to set the laws. Instead, the government suggests what it is that could be made into law and the MPs then scrutinise it and ultimately vote on it. But nonetheless, if the MPs and the Lords don't vote for it, then it doesn't become a law. So famous examples of laws that have been passed in Parliament, right, or failure of the par uh, Parliament to pass laws. First is the murder or the abolition of Death Penalty Act in 1965. Now, this is an example of a law which ended the death penalty in the UK. So as soon as this law was passed, there was no such thing as a death penalty in the UK anymore. And it was introduced by a backbench MP called Sidney Silverman, and he introduced it as what's called a private member's bill, which you might have found out about, which is a ordinary backbench MP sponsoring a piece of law rather than coming from the government. Now, an example of a law that's come from the government and uh, the government trying to pass was Boris Johnson tried to pass a law to introduce a December election in 2019. Now, in order for there to be a, an election, the Commons have to vote for it. Now, the Commons three times voted down that attempt. Now, this was because at this point there was a separate piece of legislation that meant two thirds of the MPs had to vote for an early election. Now, as we know, in fact, I showed you that election map that in 2019, in the end, it did get passed. 
but three times Parliament voted against it and prohibited, stopped an election from happening, a law about it to be made, uh, sorry, a bill about it to be made law. Second then is scrutinising the government or the executive. So Parliament, both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, has the responsibility for oversight of the executive's actions, for the government's actions, to hold them to account, to make sure they're following the laws of the land. And then collectively, both the House of Commons and the House of Lords seek to hold the government to account and expose its errors and failures. And this is often done more so by the opposition MPs and Lords. So currently the Labour, SNP, Liberal Democrat, Plaid Cymru, they tend to do it a little bit more because they are obviously um, not the party that's in government. And so it's more in their interest to do this because it makes them look more electable in the eyes of the ordinary people. Now, ministers have a duty then to defend and explain their decisions to Parliament. So as you can see here in the bottom right hand corner, you've got a picture of Rishi Sunak stood at what's called the dispatch box. As Prime Minister, he has a duty every week to attend Parliament and to face questions as to him as Prime Minister, commonly known as Prime Minister's questions. But not just him. He doesn't have to do it. He didn't just have to do it. Ministers do as well. Ministers have to attend and they have to announce policies to the Houses of Parliament first before they go through the media. They also have to come and take questions from members of Parliament. They want to know more about the decisions, more about why the decision was made, etc. Now, in order to facilitate this, you've got most senior ministers tend to come from the House of Commons with a junior minister from the House of Lords. Now, what that does is it allows scrutiny in both places. It allows ministers to be asked about the same policy in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And scrutiny happens through questions to ministers, like we've got in the right hand corner here, of uh, questions to the Prime Minister, but also through select committees and debates in general held in Parliament. And as I said a minute ago, ministers are, are bound to come and make announcements to Parliament. Well, this is actually through the uh, ministerial code. The Ministerial Code states that government policy announcements should be made to Parliament first. So this adds to their role as scrutinising the executive, doesn't it? Ministers can't go and make this announcement to the media. Instead, they've got to come to Parliament first. And this is because any laws that may, may need to be passed in order to support this would have to be made in Parliament. So it's their duty to come and explain it to Parliament so that MPs in turn may make laws with the full knowledge of what's the impact, what the policy is, etc. Now you can say in terms of your Venn diagram, right, this whole thing of scrutinising the executive goes into the similarity. Both the House of Commons and the House of Lords similarly do this. Providing ministers, this is a job also of both the Houses of Parliament, both the Commons and the Lords. Now, our parliamentary system of government sees ministers come from one of these two houses. And each department of the government has ministers from both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. As a matter of fact, Department for Transport, Department for Education, the Foreign Office, they've all got a member from both houses. For example, in Department for Transport, the Secretary of State is Mark Harper, who is an MP and so from the House of Commons. And one of the parliamentary undersecretaries is Lord Davis of Gower, who's from the House of Lords. And it means then that policy from the Department of Transport can be questioned, can be scrutinised in the House of Commons by asking Mark Harper questions and in the House of Lords by asking Lord Davis of Gower questions. And in the vast majority of cases, cabinet ministers come from the House of Commons. It is very, very uncommon now for cabinet ministers to come from anywhere but the House of Commons. And it's a long, long tradition now that prime ministers come from the House of Commons too. And in fact, the last prime minister to come from the House of Lords is this man sat here to the right, Robert Gascoigne Cecil, who was a third Marquess of Salisbury, and he was prime minister in 1895 to 1902. So we've now had over 100 years of every prime minister coming from the House of, uh, House of Commons and not the House of Lords. And as I said, the vast majority of cabinet members are from the House of Commons. However, there is a much more recent example or two examples of a Lord being a member of the cabinet 
indicating that we can't just simply say all ministers, sorry, all cabinet members come from the House of Commons. Now, up until these two examples, it was very, very uncommon. But these two examples have really kind of reminded us that there was no written rule that it had to come from the House of Commons. It was just kind of standard practice. Now, in November 2023, David Cameron, ex Prime Minister, was made Foreign Secretary in a cabinet reshuffle by the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. And although David Cameron had been Prime Minister between 2010 and 2016, he was no longer a Member of Parliament. He was no longer in the Houses of Parliament at all. He wasn't an MP, he wasn't a Lord. So, in order to allow him to be Foreign Secretary, he was immediately appointed to the House of Lords, one of those ad hoc appointments. So, now we've got the Foreign Secretary, not from the House of Commons, but from the House of Lords. We might think that's really, really uncommon. As I said, actually, uh, up until about three years ago, four years ago, it was incredibly uncommon. But what we've got here is another example. This is Nicky Morgan in the bottom right here. Now, Boris Johnson in January 2020 appointed Nicky Morgan as a Lord so she could continue on as Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport because she'd stood down as an MP in the December 2019 election. Now, this didn't last very long at all, right? You know, in February 2020, just a month later, she stepped down and, uh, and was replaced by someone else. Obviously, she remained as a Lord for the rest of her life, but um, still, still she was replaced. David Cameron already, right? November, he's already been there for three months, isn't he? So it's likely that David Cameron will remain there for a lot longer, almost certainly until the next general election, wherever that will, whenever that will be. So a job specifically of the House of Commons is to represent the electorate. Now, the House of Commons has a representative function as it is the House elected by the people of Britain. They have to represent the people of Britain because they have elected them to be there. Now, MPs, as part of what we call a representative democracy, are elected based on their opinions and vote in the House of Commons accordingly. They vote in favour or against laws accordingly. And what they don't do is they don't keep checking in with their constituents as to how they think they should vote. They don't take polls in their constituency as to how they should vote because they are representatives. And the first past the post system ties those MPs to their constituency closely. So as in uh, San Edlis, we are in the Montgomeryshire constituency. So our uh, MP, Craig Williams, he represents Montgomeryshire. He doesn't represent the town south of Israel, which is in Brecknock and Randershire. He just represents those places that are in Montgomeryshire. And this is seen no clearer, really, than in the Brexit referendum in 2016. MPs regularly voted how their constituency did in that referendum. If you look at the chart that shows you how the, the constituency voted, you'll often see in the, in the votes in the Commons afterwards, the MPs voted in a very similar way to their constituency. There is one famous example, though, in which actually the MP maybe didn't quite follow it, which is that goldsmith. Now, he was a long term Eurosceptic. He really didn't like the European Union. And he was also the MP for Richmond Park in London. And Richmond Park voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union in the referendum. And in fact, was one of the few constituencies to vote by such a margin. And so in December 2019, Zach Goldsmith was defeated in the election because people in his constituency of Richmond Park wanted an MP who wanted to agree with them, sorry, who would agree with them that they should be and the country should be within the European Union. So it shows that close represent that close link between the representation of your constituency and the MP themselves. So this is obviously something that is specific just to the Commons, so there's a difference. One thing that's specific to the Lords is the role of the hosting of the monarch. Now, every year the state opening of Parliament occurs where the monarch formally declares the government's plan for what it's going to do. And the king always and the queen before her always does this from the House of Lords. And in fact, there's Black Rod. You might have seen Black Rod on the TV during this uh, state opening of Parliament who hammers on the door of the House of Commons. Right. They are the person that is sent by the monarch to get the MPs to attend the House of Lords to listen to the speech and then has that door ceremoniously slammed in their face. And the idea of it is to show the independence of the Commons, to show that these people that won't be kowtowed by the monarch, that won't do just what the monarch says. And this has been the case ever since the 17th century. 
And this is because King Charles I, when he, the last monarch to enter the House of Commons, when he did so, he tried unsuccessfully to arrest five MPs and to try and control what the Commons and what democracy was doing. So ever since then, it is only the House of Lords that hosts the monarch. So what about the power? What are the power of these two different houses? Well, the House of Commons has the sole power to give or deny consent to taxation law proposed by the Chancellor. Nothing to do with that goes via the Lords. Now, this is because the Commons represents the taxpayers. Me, I pay tax on my income, like everyone who's in a job, right? Me, like everyone who's in a job, I was entitled to vote for our MPs, and so they are representing us, the taxpayers. The Commons power then lies in refusing and amending government laws and private members' bills. The Commons has the right to vote down a law, and if it's voted down, it isn't a law. It's only the House of Commons that can vote down a King's speech, and only the Commons can vote for an election and therefore bring a government down. So in order for there to be election, the Commons have got to vote for it, and so they're the only people that can do it. Now, the House of Lords is not allowed to interfere with what are called money bills. They can't get involved because they're not representative of the electorate. They haven't been uh, voted in by taxpayers. Crucially, the Lords cannot refuse any law. They can only delay it for up to a year in order to amend and change them. And this has been the case ever since 1949. The House of Lords is also the least powerful of the two houses. Through law and convention, its powers are limited as they're not elected. They're appointed and so their powers are limited. And the Salisbury Convention means that the Lords cannot vote down an explicit commitment from a manifesto of a winning party in an election. If the Conservatives in the election have said that we are going to promise to do this and then they win that election by convention, the Lords cannot vote it down because the people of the country have spoken, they've agreed to it by voting for them. And so surely it is what the people of the country want. So that is our Venn diagram, right? So this is where maybe you want to go back to the beginning of the video. Maybe you want to start it and maybe go a little bit slow or just re review it again. You want to highlight the differences. And the similarities. So, for example, the Lords, as we just saw there, follows the Salis Salisbury Convention. As we also saw there, the Commons are the only, are the only ones who have power over money bills. As we've also seen, both have the ability to provide ministers, whether that's to the Cabinet or whether that is to their junior ministers to ensure scrutiny. So by doing that, you're going to show that you've used this information and that you know how you could then apply it in an exam situation a bit like this. So in the exam, section B asks a question in a very specific way, which this kind of Venn diagram thing will really, really help you with. So on the right here, we've got an exam question from section B of the unit one paper in 2019. And as you can see, the specific question asks you to compare and contrast the role of something. So it tells you to read the extract below and answer the question that follows. And then it gives you the extract bit of information about a cabinet minister. It then tells you that where that extract has come from. And then it says, using that extract and your own knowledge, compare and contrast the roles of cabinet ministers with those of civil servants. Compare, you're looking at similarities. Contrast, you're looking at differences. So by doing a Venn diagram like that, you're highlighting those similarities and highlighting those differences. So let's have a look at this question. This, this question isn't from the exam, right? Absolutely not from the exam. Um, I've got nothing to do with the exam board, so I can't say, uh, you know, I'd love to say this would be the question coming up. I can't say any of that. But what I can do is I can say that this is kind of the style that they would potentially ask a question in. 
So you can see our words are exactly the same. Read the extract below and answer the question that follows. We've got an extract about the House of Lords, which is adapted from What is the House of Lords? A Guide for Secondary School Students, published in 2021. And then the question asking you to use extract A and your own knowledge to compare and contrast the roles of the House of Lords and House of Commons. So asking you to say the differences, sorry, the similarities between these two and the differences between these two as well. So let's have a read of the extract, see if we can begin to think of any similarities and differences from what it tells us. The House of Lords is the second chamber of the UK Parliament. It is independent from and complements the work of the House of Commons. Here, members are known as Lords and Baronesses. The House of Lords has around 800 members. The majority of members are appointed as life peers alongside a small number of, sorry, alongside a small number of hereditary peers and bishops. Life peers are selected for their knowledge and experience. Although some have worked in politics, life peers bring expertise from many different fields, including the medicine, the arts, charities and education. And they hold the government to account using their expertise and knowledge to look at laws and issues in detail. So this is how I suggest you go about answering that question. You start by using that extract to identify similarities, things that both the House of Commons and the House of Lords do. So initially it's telling us about its independent, then it tells us it's 800 members, tells us that it points as life peers, selects their knowledge. Some have worked in politics, so there's a similarity. Some MPs and some uh, Lords have worked in politics before they are appointed. But the main element of similarity is this. They hold the government to account using their expertise and knowledge to look, look at laws and issues in detail. So these are similarities you've identified from the extract, things that you know both the House of Commons and the House of Lords do. So to write it up, you'd be explaining that source, uh, that, sorry, the extract tells you that both the House, that tells you that the House of Lords holds the government to account, which you also know the House of Commons do, through things like Prime Minister's questions, Minister's questions and select committees. The extract also tells us that they use their expertise and knowledge to look at laws and issues in detail. This is similar to the House of Commons that, as I've seen, that, as I know, uses time, whether as uh, uh, debating time or whether as select committee time in order to scrutinise laws, vote for laws and follow up specific issues. So now, what does the extract tell you that is different? Well, it tells you they're known as lords and barons. It tells you there's 800 of them appointed for life, unlike MPs that are elected every five years. Hereditary peers and bishops, there's neither of those in the House of Commons. Selected for their knowledge and experience. That's not the case with MPs. They're not selected at all. They're elected. So again, you do the same thing. The extract tells me that lords are called lords and barons, whilst in the Commons, I know they're called members of parliament. The extract tells me there's 800 members of the House of Lords, whilst in the House of Commons, there are only 650. This is strange because it's the only upper chamber in the world which is bigger than the lower chamber or the primary chamber, etc, etc. Et and then you need to make sure, because as it tells you in the question, use your own knowledge, you need to make sure you're doing that as well. So use your own knowledge to identify similarities. This is where you would use from your Venn diagram with those big circles, right? We've got similarities in the middle, differences either side. You'd be using this information here to write a paragraph. Things that you know they equally do. Same then for differences, you'd be using your different sides. The things that make these unique. So what I suggest you do is I suggest you use that Venn diagram now to write this answer up. It'll be a million, million times easier. I promise you, if you've done that Venn diagram, answering this question would be a million times easier to do. So have a go. Give it to your teacher, your lecturer and, uh, and get them to mark it. See how you're done with it. See how you're doing with it. And practice with that exam technique and that'll serve you well for this question, which is 24 marks, which is the, uh, the question with the most number of marks in the whole exam paper. So practice with these Venn diagrams because that way you will be using that knowledge and you'll practice and you'll be better prepared for this kind of section B question. So that's session two done, the comparison of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. I hope you found it useful. 
Next session, we'll look at a comparison between a prime minister in the UK and a first minister and their work within Wales. So as I said in the previous session, we're going to hold a live uh, question and answer session on Tuesday the 6th of February between half six and quarter past seven. So join us to ask us anything you're unsure of. Uh, run through any ideas of what you want to include in terms of if you're going to do that essay for section B and then um, hopefully we can uh, or I can give you some help in hand uh, help in hand and help you prepare better for your exams in uh, in well not too far a distance thank you very much for uh, using this resource and uh, listening to the tips I've shared with you on how to succeed at your politics AS level and I wish you all the very best in your exam <laughs>